Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Hamway. I'm the Director of Infrastructure Planning at the MBTA. Thank you for coming out uh, to tonight's meeting. Apologies that we're getting a little bit of a, of a late start. Um, before we get into the presentation, just wanted to make sure everybody was aware where the emergency exits are. There's, they're on the side of the room, and also just you can exit um, in the case of an emergency out the doors that you all uh, came in. There is uh, restrooms uh, down the corridor as you come out, out of the top of the auditorium and, and down that way. Uh, this meeting was scheduled to run until 8 o'clock uh, tonight for two hours. We're getting a late start, so we'll, we'll keep the, the meeting open uh, for two hours. Um, you know, we'll try to get to everybody's questions. We just ask people when we get there to try to limit your comments to a couple uh, minutes each so that everybody has a chance to talk and so we can respond. Um, so. With that, I will uh, turn it over to Alexander Markiewicz, who's the Deputy Director of the Bus Modernization Program for the MBTA, and he'll lead us through the presentation Q and Q&A. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So oh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. As Scott mentioned, my name is Alexander Markiewicz. I'm the Deputy Director of the Bus Facility Modernization Program at the MBTA. And I'm really excited to provide a 15% design update for the new bus maintenance facility at Arborway and our bus electrification project there. So I'm actually going to get started with an icebreaker, get a sense of who's in the room, and then we'll talk a little bit about bus electrification at the MBTA. Um, an overview of the benefits of this project, um, an overview of what we're proposing in terms of the design here, and then finish up with the cost estimate and schedule our next steps. So just bear with me. Um, <laughs> wanted to get a sense kind of who, who we have here with us. So if you guys could raise your hand if the answer is yes to this question, and then just keep your hand up. We'll hopefully have different hands raised by the end. Okay. So who here is a frequent, regular MBTA bus rider? Go ahead and, yeah. Raise my hand for my day. Who here is a resident of the Stony Brook neighborhood? Excellent. We know we're right in our backyard with this facility. Okay. Who here regularly rides their bike or walks on the Emerald Necklace connector? Very cool. Very good. Okay. And then hopefully we'll get everyone <laughs> who here is really excited about decarbonization, public transportation, affordable housing, urban development. Okay. If someone's not raising their hand, you might be in the wrong room. That's totally okay. <laughs> hopefully you can stay, learn about this great project, and you know, have questions or get excited about it. All right. So the MBTA is aiming to fully electrify our bus fleet by 2040. This is one of the most aggressive goals um, targets in the nation, and, and we're really excited about, about it. Um, in order to get there, we have to construct a new facility, that, or we're planning to construct a new facility that is equipped with charging infrastructure to support that electric fleet every two to three years. And that represents a major investment in our bus system. In the first three few years of this transition, our plan is to buy a mixture of hybrid buses and battery electric buses. And that allows us to make sure that we're keeping our buses reliable by keeping that average pre age down while also getting started on this transition. But you can see over time, as we get to 2040, we're increasing the percentages, percentage of battery electric buses in the fleet. Um, and that's what's illustrated on this graph here. And so we're really pleased with this target that we're set is actually in line with, oops, is actually in line with the legislative mandate that came out at, uh, last year, I believe, um, and the new climate law for the state of Massachusetts which is going to require us to solely purchase electric buses after 2029 and fully electrify our fleet by 2040. So we're, we're happy that we're on our way to this target. In terms of the Arbor Way project, this is going to be the second fully new facility um, that we're building after the Quincy facility. And the reason that we're prioritizing it is the second project of the nine facilities that we have is for a, a few important you know, factors. First, the fleet that we have at Arborway 
is 118 compressed natural gas buses that are due to retire starting in 2028. And so we need a new facility with charging infrastructure in place ahead of that retirement if we're going to be able to replace those buses with battery electric buses and not have to buy another round of compressed natural gas buses that would last another 12, 14 years. Secondly, a lot of the regs that come out of the Arbor Way facility today serve our trains with critical communities, low income communities and communities of color. We want to make sure as we're transitioning the battery electric buses that we're prioritizing getting tailpipe emission reductions for these areas of our network. Okay, <laughs> that's the whole presentation. <laughs> Just, just kidding. Um, all right. Um, thirdly, as many of you are aware, I know there's a number of local folk. The the condition of that existing facility um, is really not great. It's not acceptable for our workforce. It was originally built as temporary 20 years ago, um, and it's it's truly you know inadequate for modern working conditions. So those are the three main drivers. With this project, we've got a number of benefits specifically related to electrification as well as some of the other benefits we'll talk about tonight. So we're planning to expand the fleet from 118 compressed natural gas buses to 200 battery electric buses. What this allows us to do is to transit, transition all of the routes in green that already come out of the other way facility, as well as some additional routes that are shown, for example, in blue on the map, that um, serve, you know, Roxbury, Roxbury Georgia, Sir Magnum, and really expanding the benefit of this electrification project to um, some additional areas. In addition, the project is proposed to have a mixture of 40 foot, you know, regular typical city bus and 60 foot articulated bus. This would allow us to upgrade um, some rates, like the number 32, for example, for a high ridership route that experiences crowding to a 60 foot bus as well as pull over some routes like the number 28 on Blue Hill Ave or 39 here in JP <laughs> to the new, new facility. At the end of this project, 40% of the local buses in Boston will be electric, and that includes all the bus service in a number of Boston neighborhoods. So before getting into the details of the project itself, I also want to just highlight the community engagement approach that we took. <laughs> So our first MBTA led public meeting, which was virtual, and some of you were at, um, that we held in December of 2021. And that's when we were taking off the design of the project. Um, and so the MBTA hosts public meetings that are design milestones. So this is our 15% public meeting. But we also wanted to make sure that we were providing additional opportunity for input as there were many interested community groups um, in, that are you know, interested in this project. And so we had the opportunity to go out and provide an update and get feedback on the project um, and a number of other occasions by going out to different meetings. Um, here's a list of 14 of those occasions. Um, wanted to summarize some of what we heard. We heard a range of comments, um, and you know, a lot of them have been focused on making sure that this project's maintaining acreage for affordable housing. Also, on um, being responsive from a design perspective to the surrounding area, traffic, et cetera. And so, I wanted to highlight some of those and hope that in this presentation, we're really demonstrating how we're being responsive to those comments, you know, iteratively as we're working through this preliminary design. Next question. So now kind of diving into the site. I know many of you are very familiar with this site, but just for anyone who isn't, um, the, the new facility will be uh, planning to make use of the MBT land that we have available. We have two parcels right now that are across from par parcel station, just off the map from the south, uh, southwest corner there. You can see the orange line and southwest border along the left side of the map. As well as Washington Street, we have 3600 Washington Street and the 500 Arbor Way parcel. So when we're thinking about how are we going to build a new facility on this property, um, which you know does require kind of like a pretty like rectangular shaped footprint in order to accommodate an all-indoor bus facility, 
um, we're thinking about a number of different constraints that are really like driving our design process. So I'll just kind of walk through this. First, of course, we need to maintain bus service during the construction of the new piece of um, So our existing bus facility, as you guys are aware, is along Washington Street, that 3600 Washington Street. Next, EWC has a, a major conduit that's kind of a conduit that's really running by stepping through the site. And we know that we can't build directly on top of that so that they can maintain access in case of you know, maintenance needs or something like that. Next, um, in discussions with the city of Boston, we understand that the former pull yard, um, which you know, now houses additional DPW functions, is really critical for um, DPW and frankly, for all of us who are roadway users and users of city services. And so we need to maintain um, that site and, and their accommodate their needs. Then we know that you want to maintain the Admiral Necklace connector that was constructed through the Casey over past project, um, the Casey Arbor Lake project, and is now um, part of DCR land. And then finally, moving back to Washington Street, we know that that parcel, in addition to our existing facility, was really targeted for future community development in a number of the planning processes that have occurred over the last couple of decades. So we wanted a project that was able to honor that. So what we're proposing is constructing a two-level all e door bus facility largely on that 500 Arbor Way parcel. The first level of which is highlighted in the darker orange would be um, squarely on that 500 Arbor Way parcel. And the second level of which would span over the culvert, open air at the first level, and come down um, to accommodate our bus program needs. Um, this will provide a modern and safe working condition for our workforce and improve bus reliability for our drivers. Um, however, we're really excited you know, that we have some other benefits that we're able to identify with this approach, this two-level approach, which is that we have dedicated 6.82 acres. I know we've talked about 6.5 in the past, but we realized that that wasn't including the public roadway, which is um, accessing the northern part of our site, but would also provide access to those parcels. For 6.82 acres, for future development, a process that would be led you know, by the city of Boston in conjunction with all of us. And then in addition, we are maintaining the EPW site um, with the small exception of having e egress at the, the very top of it um, for our Right. And then finally, of course, we have maintained the full acreage with the MLM connector that was built during the case of the project. So, you know, as, as we got started, we knew we wanted to be thinking early on about the design of this facility, not just the, the footprint or the layout, but also kind of what it was going to look like in order to be able to have a robust process. Oh, okay. A robust process, um, you know, and be responsive to the community. Um, so here you can see our original proposal that we circulated at some of those community meetings for the last uh, couple of months for the, the the design of the facility. I'll just highlight. You can visualize what I was describing with that second level standing over the culvert and that open air space underneath. Um, and then I'll also highlight that the first floor actually, or the, the front portion of the building does not have two levels. It's only a single level um, in terms of bus, bus levels. Um, so you have that lower kind of step down as you get to Arbor. But we heard some feedback. We heard it looked a little too industrial. We heard that it wasn't responsive. To the, the, the surrounding residential neighborhood or Franklin Park. And so, what our architecture team has done over the last month um, has really kind of taken that feedback back and worked on a proposal that, you know, we feel is responsive to some of those comments that we want to walk through with you guys tonight. Um, and are hopeful, you know, that we'll hear some, some positive feedback, but also open to all, all feedback. Um, so what, what we're proposing is some modifications um, so that, uh, uh, that I'll kind of walk through. So first, in terms of materials, we had on the first level um, a, a significant amount of concrete paneling. 
we're proposing that we could use instead a gray brick, and that's something that you see a lot in the area, both for like residential buildings as well as that you know, storage facilities, et cetera. So a range of uses. Um, then we have adjusted the color of the second level and the material there, which can be, you know, evoke a little bit more of like connection to the natural greenery that's surrounding this site. Um, and then finally, we identified an opportunity to break up the, the sort of large expanse of the building by having a, a bit more um, opportunities for windows and then also this articulation in the roof line that just provides a little bit more variation. So we're excited to hear what you guys think. also wanted to just have a little bit of like a before and hopefully future after um, with, you know, today's uh, today's um, site. Um, here, I just wanted to zoom in on the area of the building that's the closest to the sidewalk of um, the Emerald Necklace Connector um, and just point out that there, you know, this is the preliminary. Hi there, this is the interpreter. I think you've gone mute. I cannot hear you right now. But I think we also wanted to highlight that um, that, uh, the, the, that you will actually be obscured once the, the 6.8 acres is developed. Um, we're, we're not saying that this is you know what the shape of that development would look like, but we just wanted to highlight with these mappings that you know, there would not only be an obscure view of the facility from Washington Street, but also that that site is, is quite large and there's plenty of opportunity to build kind of a range of building types on that width of a, that type of a way. Um, but but I, can, I did want to highlight, <laughs> just for posterity, that any proposals for that development will definitely be run through, you know, the city of Boston process that will, you know, prioritize, kind of establish an open community process based on um, history and kind of moving forward. Um, so I won't go into detail about the ins and outs of the facility. We've worked really, really hard with our internal operations and maintenance staff to make sure that it meets their needs. Um, but I just wanted to highlight kind of a few things to help folks understand kind of why this facility needs to be the size of it. So on the first floor in the upper corner, we're using that area largely on the first floor for building infrastructure to support electric bus charging and other sort of back of house infrastructure. And then on the um, eastern side of the building, we'll have the maintenance space, the maintenance space and, and support areas. And then in this just sort of western side of the first floor, which is smaller than the second floor, We'll have some bus parking in the south where there is that light glazing. Um, we have the bus operations, sort of like break room and offices, et cetera. And then the northern part of the building, we have the ramp system to get up to the top level. And then on the other side of the culvert, underneath the overhang, we have enclosed, fully enclosed um, bus washers to circle through. Um, we, I have been talking about two levels, but I do want to highlight it bus level, so those are about 30 feet ceilings um, in order to accommodate the height of buses as well as our charging infrastructure, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So we can have a mezzanine for some areas, which is a traditional office and support spaces. And then the second level of the facility is largely bus parking and employee parking. We're doing something a little bit innovative here that we picked up from our friends down at MCA in New York, which is having you know some dedicated employee parking, but some areas where when the buses leave in the morning, you'll open up a little bit more parking for employees, and that really helps economize the space. Um, finally, on this floor, we will have space for a backup operation control center. This largely won't be used, hopefully, like never, never used, because it's really going to be a backup in case for some reason our downtown location that um, is, is critical for all of our subway and bus operations 
is inaccessible. So in terms of site access and a few things to highlight that have changed over time, um, we are anticipating that buses would primarily access the site via Arbor Way, entering and turning right and coming, entering into the sort of middle of the facility there and exiting from under the overhang. But there is an opportunity and the design accommodates them also entering and exiting via Washington Street. The employee would primarily enter from Washington Street and pop right up that ramp that you saw on the northern part of the building. And then that's also where we'd expect visitors and deliveries would enter. Visitors, um, which you might be like a vendor um, for different uh, bus, you know, needs, or um, maybe it's MBTA staff that are in the field going, you know, working at different stations and they have to drive a vehicle because they're kind of hopping about, um, would be parking in a small surface parking lot that's in the bottom corner of the site with 25 spaces. We actually originally had planned for this, this um, parking lot to be 75 spaces, but reduced it based on taking a closer look and some of the feedback that we heard. Deliveries then would, and we would anticipate like routine deliveries would use a loading dock that's sort of in that back, oh, I just saw the clicker, sorry. Um, back at corner where you see that sort of light orange area and then exiting via Forest Hill Street, they'd only be permitted at that point to turn right because they won't be able to go under the bridge um, at Cemetery Road. Um, a couple other things to note, we are planning for a privacy secure kind of fence, uh, fence treatment along that back edge that backs up the Stony Brook area at some residential area. Um, hoping it provides a bit of a buffer. Um, and then we are planning for like a, a sort of more wrought iron approach for the western edge. And this is all flexible, open your feet up. Um, along the western edge and portions of the front, since a lot of the building comes so close to the recovery line, you don't actually anticipate any kind of full fencing around in our discussion of our security folks. Um, and so that's another kind of benefit for the interface with the Emerald Netflix. Um, we are planning on moving to or consolidating two existing curb cuts um, that uh, exist over the Emerald Necklace connector, and for that, we'll need a DCR construction and access permit. In terms of buses, as I mentioned, we are flexible. You know, it's the design accommodates both access points Arbor and Washington Street, and we've heard a range of, of kind of ideas on what's preferable there, so that can be kind of a working in progress um, as, as we move and we're looking forward to feedback on that. Um, okay. So in terms of traffic impacts, um, the facility is largely, you know, it's the impacts are, are very minimal because <laughs> they got the pause here. So, in terms of traffic impacts, sorry, all that. Um, in terms of traffic impacts, you know, it's an existing facility, so it's largely the same. We are increasing the size a little bit by 80 buses. That's not buses in service every single day. Um, that's including some spares. Um, and we are uh, including about, you know, 200 employee parking spaces. Our employees come over to a range of hours. So it's not all at once. And so we're uh, accommodating that when we're thinking about how many parking spaces. Um, I'll just move over to this side. <laughs> so um, the the good thing though about a bus facility too, in terms of traffic, is not only is it not a, a high volume of vehicles, um, but also we largely are operating outside of the traditional peak hour for the surrounding roadways. 
um, because, you know, most of your buses, folks are getting in very, very early in the morning and the buses are leaving so they can be out during rush hour. Um, and you can see that illustrated in detail on the graph on the top here where we sort of zoom in and highlight what the actual peak hour of the roadway is um, versus uh, when the, the buses and the employees would be coming in and out of the facility. So we did want to provide some context. Um, and so we highlighted sort of with the graph on the bottom here, how many, um, how our bus sort of bus and personnel entrance and exit compares to just the overall surrounding roadway over the course of the day. And as you can see, it's almost um, imperceptible. In terms of bus charging, we're planning to use those overhead panograph system and we have um, an overhead panograph available at every bus charging, uh, sorry, every bus parking spot. Um, and we are using a soft, we'll be using a, a software to orchestrate that charging to help kind of manage those loads so that we're distributing the charging overnight um, and not kind of charging all the buses all at once. And we've been coordinating closely already with Eversource um, to describe in front of our anticipated power loads and how they can accommodate that. We also have a number of sustainability and resiliency features that we've included in this design. In terms of heating and cooling, cooling we're not just doing electric buses, but we're also electrifying our heating system, which we're pretty excited about. Um, it, you know, in line with the latest standards in building code and our carbon reduction strategy in the Commonwealth, but it's something that's pretty innovative for building at this pipe, and so we're pretty excited. Um, we've also sized the cooling load to um, be based on future projections for heating needs in the summer, sorry, cooling needs in the summer, um, which we think was you know, really important in terms of long-term resilience. Talked a little bit about this on the previous slide, but you know, with a big building and a chart bus charging, we have a significant power load. And so we've been working with Eversource on how to accommodate that and how to build redundancy into that to make sure that we're always able to be operational by feeding um, the facility from two um, diverse locations. And in terms of water, we're also using a number of strategies to be sustainable um, and resilient in terms of water reclamation and harvesting rainwater. Um, and and in, and the stormwater system we've upsized to account for um, the you know anticipation that we'll likely have bigger kind of storms, heavier precipitation in the future due to climate change. So I touched on a number of these points, but just to kind of wrap up um, some of the changes that we've made based on the feedback we've heard so far. Um, so we, as I noted, illustrated in this image on the bottom here, we've reduced the height of the, the portions of the first level of the building or second level of the building in the front um, to have more of a step down as you get to the Arbor Way. We also actually reduced the finished floor elevation by two feet, which reduced the building height by two feet to help reduce the height of retaining walls that are kind of tying into the existing grading while still um, accommodating our flood resiliency directive and requirements of the NUTA. We reduced the size of that parking lot that we were talking about, the visitor parking lot. And we've also, um, as you might've noticed on some of those site plans for some of you who've been following this, narrowed the driveway and some of those drive access lanes so that we can expand the green space um, that we have in the front of the building. Um, and then we added the exit um, with Forest Hills, and as we've discussed, um, just kind of refine the, the design of the building. Um, and we're we're still working. This is you know 15% preliminary design. Um, something we're excited about is we're working closely with our partners at the City of Boston to see if there's an opportunity to move that 25 space parking lot up to the back corner of the site, away from the Arbor Way. Um, if we can find a way to kind of maybe do a parking share with the DPW function. No, no promises. We gotta figure out if it works. It's gonna be hard. It's pretty tight area up there, but we're working through it. We'll definitely um, provide kind of additional information on that as as it's available. And we're, you know, continually evolving the design of the building and thinking about the landscaping, as well as um, open to you know discussing that standard operating procedures for the buses themselves. 
in terms of the entrances and exits. In terms of our preliminary cost estimate, our 15% drawings has a cost estimate of around $500 million, which includes 30% contingency and escalation um, based on our projections of escalation, kind of what we've been seeing and what we're hearing from the economists we work with. I uh, did want to highlight the MHA actually sets our project budget at 30%. Um, and that's in line with the FCA Federal Transit Administration guidelines. Um, this construction cost estimate does not include total costs that you might see in the capital improvement plan, like um, some of our additional professional services, the utility upgrade, our back end costs, contingency. So I just wanted to make note of that. We do have $36 million available to keep the project moving. And we will be uh, requesting construction funding in the fall. In terms of next steps, um, we are finishing up the preliminary design this summer, um, and we're continuing to coordinate with all of the relevant key, you know, stakeholders, the city, the WSC, Eversource, DCR. We're having this meeting. We're also having an open house that next Wednesday. It'll just be for folks, bus riders, folks coming by who are interested in the project. Um, we presented our updated design um, option tonight, but we'll have a few like additional options at that open house with some modifications that folks can look at and think uh, about. And then for MEPA, we have a notice of project change that we'll be submitting to them at the end of the month and will be published in the first monitor available in July. We'll work to incorporate feedback before handing the project to the next design team that's actually going to bring it through final design and construction. Um, some of them are here tonight, including our um, MBTA project manager um, for that next phase. That contract should be awarded at the July uh, 27th board meeting, um, and that process will probably be a couple of years and include many more opportunities for stakeholder engagement. Hoping to start construction in 2025 and targeting completion in 2020. So, apologies if I went that long, but um, that is uh, all we've had in terms of the presentation tonight. And so I think um, we'll transition into the, the Q&A period and Scott will um, yeah, come up and help me kick that off. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, uh, I'll distribute the mic. You, oh, okay. Start. That's so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So I think before we jump to open it up, I did want to recognize that we've um, got a few electeds in the room. Want to just see if uh, Representative Holmes wants to comment. He might wait. Okay. Um, okay. So I think uh, how we're going to do this is we've got you know more than an hour, and you know we'd love to hear all the comments and questions. Um, if folks could just raise their hand, Scott will come around with the mic and we'll get it started. Okay. Does it work? Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, take about a minute. And I want to just say that there is only one issue that confronts this Arbery Yard project. It will drive all the decisions to be made. Uh, aesthetics, community it's, it's everything. It is the loss of an acre and a half to the Department of Public Works, despite 20 year promise that we would get the eight acres. Um, the, the meetings we have now and from now on is basically based on putting lipstick on a pig. But until we get back our eight, acre and a half and our 100 units of housing, None of this stuff makes any difference at all, really. Um, by the way, I sent probably at the turn of, before the turn of the century, I sent probably a thousand hours, three years at least on the Arbor Way Committee that was the community's committee dealing with the negotiations between the city and the team, dealing with land use, traffic, all kinds of stuff like that. So I have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. Um, I won't go through the history. We know the promise. We know it was put out that we would get eight plus acres, at least eight acres. Uh, that stood for 20 years, and then suddenly the Department of Public Works 
after the team designed the first pass of the facility, decided that they were not going to give up the pole yard. Uh, each winter, the Paulson's Department of Public Works stores a big pile of salt down at the pole yard, which used up over the winter. They can't seem to find another place to put it all over Boston, anywhere in Boston. I live about two blocks from there, and I can assure you that for the first 12, 15 years, the pile of salt wasn't there. It only appeared in the past two years. And I just have this image in my mind of all the dogs in my neighborhoods whizzing on telephone poles to establish their turf. <laughs> um, what it's going to cost us is the deal is off. It's going to cost us 100 plus units of housing, literally across the street from a major transportation park. Buses everywhere, commuter rail, orange line running into the mass transit in Boston, all 100 units of housing were gone for a big pile of salt. Um, it's, I guess it's fine. A big pile of salt plus whatever uses they can think of, maybe sometime, someday. Someone once said housing crisis, transit-related housing, climate change, okay? A few years ago, I campaigned for our new mayor and voted for her. I voted for the new governor because I thought they both had the experience and the vision to reconcile turf issues between different agencies that they supervise. Um, now the excuse seems to be that incompetence of one department can drive the decisions of a huge number of other agencies and cost the city an enormous weight price in development and housing. Didn't someone once say uh, housing crisis, transit-related housing? The only excuse we're getting out of these agencies is we had 23 years to design it right, but now we've run out of time, so now we're going to build it wrong. It's the same as it ever was, the same as it ever was. So, thank you, thank you for the comment. Um, and I, I understand that I, I take very seriously the opportunity to open up space for affordable housing and all any other development that's desired by the community on this project. As you said, it's transit oriented. I think, you know, what we've put together, um, we believe is really optimizing the outcomes for to meet the community, for affordable housing, the city's priorities in terms of housing, the state's priorities in terms of housing, the priorities in terms of decarbonization, getting um, reliable bus service to our bus riders, um, which is you know more than just decarbonization, but also getting people where they need to go. And also the critical functions that the DGW provides in terms of both winter operations and other plans that they have for that site. Um, and we also find that the site that we've put together for housing is very comparable to all of the previous plans that we've looked through in the last 20 years for this, this site. I think there are some you know, modifications, but it's essentially the same the same parcel of land, and there's opportunity to build a lot of housing on it, um, or whatever folks want, because we're we're not running that project. But I I do want to kind of emphasize that we we've, we've really worked hard to, to maximize. We're going up two levels, which is a great expense for the team to take on, not just in terms of capital cost, but also operationally. But we're happy to do it, and we're we're excited about. Um, this opportunity to provide a really great development parcel um, that accommodates uh, a significant amount of, of housing or whatever future development is decided and is, is in line with all of the previous planning efforts um, that that have to have all the previous, frankly, designs that have occurred for this time. Uh, listen, what I'm going to do, uh, this gentleman's uh, next, and then Ashley will be working that. Um, Great. That aisle for children will alternate. Uh, but if you see someone who's had their hands up for a long time, you want to make sure we get to just let us know. But we'll go to Thank you. Um, and my question is um, I'm a little bit surprised about one of your proposals, and that is that you were proposing to build 200 parking spaces for your employee. That would be surprising. You're supposed to be MBTA, you're supposed to be you got a good employee. To take buses or subways and advice provide or provide your own vehicle yeah. to provide that, that simply didn't make sense. And, you know, uh, 
So, you know, that, that is space, uh, 200 parking spaces could be used again, as the gentleman said, for housing and the, the, the most, you know, what is needed here. So that really didn't make sense. And I hope you will reconsider that um, uh, proposal that you, you've made. So well, that's my question. You know, we, we don't have a 24 hour transit system here. Um, and so for a lot of folks who are, who are taking the buses out at five, six in the morning, you know, they're going to have to get to work before then in order to make that happen. And I, I, I take transit to work every day. I, you know, I, I'm with you, but I think that there's, there's not really a realistic opportunity for folks who are getting there really early in the morning or working the overnight, you know, overnight or late night shift, um, especially if, if they're coming from a range of places um, that the MBTA might, might not even serve, you know, down kind of south of the city, et cetera. So um, we worked really hard to minimize it as much as possible. The, you'll notice there's that this is a smaller parking proposal than we have on the site today um, and on many of our bus facility sites because we, we know that this is an important issue and that folks are um, able to take transit if they're starting in the middle of the day um, or if they're swinging on at our south. Um, but I think that the reality is, since we don't have that 24-hour system, and folks are coming from a range of places, um, we do have to provide that for pain. But it's a great question. Thank you. Well, Hello, um, my name is Dave and I live in the neighborhood. I ride bicycles, I walk, um, I take public transit. We don't own a car, thank you. Um, I have two questions and, and thank you. I, I understand that come, you know, that sentiment, your response is to be brief so that we get to everybody would probably be appreciated, but I, I actually appreciate your responding and I would like to your response to two questions, if that's okay. Um, perhaps I've missed it, but I see a gigantic, ginormous roof on that facility. Did I miss the opportunity for solar? Um, and then the second question is, I also see the buses cutting across the GCR connector, which is a bike path and a pedestrian path. What do you plan to do to prevent giant buses from hitting pedestrians, and bicycles on that path. Thank you. Now, keep it brief. We are planning for solar. Oversight to not include that in the presentation, um, but it is going to be a huge opportunity. Um, and then we're working closely with DCR and our, our civil engineer to identify all of the appropriate safety measures to ensure lines of sight, to ensure um, the buses slow down, et cetera, um, to, to ensure safety at that, that crossing site. Um, so I'll just keep it brief though. Hello, my name is Kurt Thorne. I'm a member of the JP Neighborhood Council and also of the Arbor Ridge Subcommittee. Um, you came to us some time ago and you kind of had a series of asks. You asked for the number of buses to be increased from 118 to 200. We asked, we didn't say no. You asked for additional office space, we didn't say no. And you asked, I believe at the time, to have additional parking for staff. You didn't say no. So we gave a lot. But then in addition to all of that, we took something else. We took away our eight acres. And that quite honestly is a very simple issue in many of our minds. You, the MOU states that you are required to provide eight acres or more for community and housing uses. You are in violation of the MOU. And you need to understand that. You can see all the yellow stickers here. You can see that we are unalterably opposed to that issue. And I think you need to be aware of it. And quite honestly, the salt yard, which is driving this whole world, I'd like to know how you decided not to build over the salt yard, which is a very logical thing to do. If your architectural team needs help, there are more than enough architects who can help you out in trying to figure it out. I mean that sincerely, we'll do it pro bono. But it's a silly thing to have this whole project be driven by a salt yard, a pool yard, which is, by the way, on a historical Arbor Way uh, road, 
designed by OMSEC. Thank you very much. It doesn't make any sense. It's not respectful. But, um, I don't know. The next issue is quite honest. I'll be done very quickly. The next issue, very simply, is the MOU calls for additional reviews with the community in addition to schematic design, design and development. We have not really just had a review process, which is a face to face reviewing the drawings, commenting upon them, and getting our response to you and then your reaction to them. Sitting down with the design team, this is how it normally works. I've, I've been practicing architecture for 55 years around the world in 14 different countries. I went through over 200 projects of mine. They've all been collaboratively done. This is the first one that I participated in where it's just like you take and we just give. That's all that happens. And that's not appropriate. We need to collaborate together. I don't know how I can clear to you. We can sit down with your both and showing us finished design sketches. That's not where you had to do. Don't waste your time. Sit down with us for initial sketches. We can talk about those. It would be very helpful. I do appreciate that you picked up on the uh, industrial look. Unfortunately, I don't think it's gotten any better with your green element. The issue that's missing in all of this is scale. You're building a huge project and you need to minimize scale and you're not doing that. You've made it more bombastic, quite honestly, the green color at this point. We again would volunteer to help your design team happily along, bat around ideas, work with you on that together. No problem at all. The last thing I would like to ask is, where's the mayor? I I have I have written two emails to the mayor's office, no responses. I've called twice, no responses about this particular issue, and asked who in the city would be in charge of this project. The mayor's office is a member of this MOU. If it goes wrong, she's responsible. And quite honestly, we hold her responsible at this point. She's better than this. I voted for her. I like her, I know her, I've worked with her in the past. All she has to do is sit down with the departments and say, look at this guys, the neighbor's not gonna buy this. How else can we do this? And she can accomplish it very, very easily. And we expect more of her quite honestly in that. You know, we need to work collaboratively. We've been saying that over and over, we're not doing that. You're, you're going in your corner, you're working on them, you're coming back and showing us what you're resolving. That's not how it works. Pull up our sleeves, let's work on it together. That's the only way to accomplish this. But again, the eight acres, that's environment as far as we are concerned. Thank you. Um, I didn't expect to get the microphone already, but uh, I didn't uh, get here in time to see that entire presentation. But uh, I, I want to express a, a um, an opinion which might be way out on a different uh, direction from uh, from what might be politically uh, the the MOU that was developed when it was developed I feel is null and void and does not up does not pertain to the situation that is existent now. If you looked at ridership at the time the MOU was being developed, you would look back to World War II for maximum uh, the utilization of, uh, of, of, of uh, public transit. We, uh, only a decade ago did we ever exceed the 1943 levels of the service in, in the system. We were looking at trying to minimize minimize a uh, a um, a facility at Forest Hills that that it may not have been realized by the people that were negotiating it would need to be made substantially bigger. It may need to back up some Routes that were being run out of Cabot, or were being run out of Quincy, or other other places that had low uh, uh, low reserve capacity. Um, that uh, the the uh, uh, we we uh, uh, we we were trying to deal with 
uh, a different technology of, of propulsion in buses. It's been changed about three times since then. Uh, when, when we were looking at the first designs, we were uh, looking at diesel buses. Then we were looking at uh, CNG buses. Then we were looking, well, are the electric buses going to be under a wire or under on, on batteries? Uh, it's uh, it's still uh, I'm not I'm not con convinced that we've got the right technology even at this point. But I can tell you one thing: we need we we probably need the 200 buses pretty soon. Uh, There's uh, there's a possibility I see in 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 the design of maybe some outward facing uh, facilities, maybe maybe a uh, a lunch counter that faces outwards, maybe maybe a uh, a, 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 a a bank branch that faces outwards, some other things like that, uh, but. Uh, I think we got to be really, really flexible about this because the first designs I saw for for a for for a bus garage on this site were so were so peculiarly laid out that I don't think I would have been able to drive a bus through them. So. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your comments. Start all over. Yes. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bernard Doherty. I'm a member of the Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Council, vice chair of the Neighborhood Council. I'm also uh, the chairperson for the Astu Martin of South Street Neighbor Association, which has been in effect for 42 years. And you can tell I wear it pretty well, but I have been in that position for quite a while. And I was also uh, one of the founding members of the CPCAY, which led to us achieving a memorandum of understanding between ourselves and the mayor and CA and other parties to bring to this community a bus facility, which was based on, that gentleman is correct, it was based on a different uh, type of bus and a different type of uh, approach. That could change tomorrow with AI rapidly running towards us. We could all be sitting here with you know, robots taking our place. I don't know. But the reality becomes we're dealing with the here and the now. But we also have to deal with the past. You know, somebody says to me that, well, you know, these things have gone out of date and that, that, that doesn't count. You have 118 buses that you're allowed to have on that site. And I intend to fight very hard to make sure that that's the number you stick to. And if we get some things done, we're going to bring it down to 104. You read, the, read the MOU. It's there for a reason. It is not our fault that we did not get this done. We're talking about budgets put up on the screen here. Well, I remember when we had a presentation, when we first started out, when Quincy was going to be the first place to deal with this electrification of bus. Well, everything was going along just fine until they got back the quotes that they had sent on out, requests for quotes. And when they came back in, they realized they were woefully under budget. And the MBTA, frankly, doesn't have a great history going for itself at the moment. I'm not saying anything to embarrass you all, because I don't think you should be embarrassed by it, but it's the facts. You've had situations where you've had ceiling tiles falling down on people. You've had situations where people dragged to their death. You've had situations where planes are, uh, trolleys are running off tracks or crashing into one another. I'm really concerned that it's not so much the mismanagement as the fact that we really don't have management that's qualified to handle the situation they face. I agree, we may have an emergency situation, but panicking to get it done, throwing money at it, is not the way we should approach it. What we need to be doing is listening to the people in this community who have to live with this project, as I have for the last 76 years, and to make sure that somebody realizes that what we're looking to produce here is something that will serve the community. We're not against the facility there. We're just saying we don't want you to cram everything you can into, onto it. 
That's not the way to go about it. We signed an MOU uh, with Mayor Menino, the MBTA, and one other party I can't remember at the moment, back in 2001. We had a number of different things that occurred in 2002, 2004, and 2005. I'd be glad to show you the paperwork. But the reality became that there was no money available. Why? Because people changed. Administrations change. These things happen all the time. We could be standing here five years from now and saying, what happened? We didn't get anything. We agreed with everything we should do. We didn't have the money. They're telling us if you don't have a, what was that, $53 million budget you said you were going to have, but you don't really have it. I've done construction all over the world. And I was a procurement manager for large architectural engineering firms. And I can tell you, the first thing we went for was, what is your budget? What's your schedule? What are your people that you're going to go to for your equipment? Who are the uh, subcontractors going to be? How are you going to put down all this? Do you do your technicals? Move on and on. Just lo get it. logistics, material storage, on down the line. This is not the way to do it. And I don't know who you got working on it. So for me, as a leader in my community, I'm going to be steadfastly against the way you're approaching this right now because it doesn't serve the needs of the people. And one last thing I'll say on the parcel of eight acres, that means a lot to me. That means also that 1.3 acres that somebody wants to keep salt on. Why, I don't know. I can understand why you want to do But I can tell you, the number of years I've been around, last two years over here, that's the first time they put it there. We got along fine. We had a place to store it. But I don't want to see housing, which is so needed by elderly and senior citizens in this community and around this the city, be left aside. And I certainly don't want to hear the word affordable without somebody explaining to me what the term means. I want to see a dollar sign there, okay? I don't want to see this stuff coming up anymore in the future where somebody says, well, we're going to give them 20% off the local MRI, MRI, whatever it is, and that's going to be 20%. You know what the average is right now for MRI? $86,000. My God, somebody who's going to go one bedroom for $3,000 might be able to qualify for 20% at $2,700. Can you imagine what these working class people are going through? This is ridiculous. So I hope that you'll listen and get angry about what's being presented here and not let this just blow on by. And I hope that the MBTA will realize that one meeting with the community to introduce us to this is not the way it's going to go down. Thank you. Just keeping it brief, did want to respond about our process. I mean, you know, as I've mentioned to many of you before, we have these MBTA led meetings at our design milestones, but we have been extremely open to coming to a number of different community groups to provide updates on the project and to have a back and forth, have a discussion. And um, with each of those meetings, we've been responsive with what we come back with, um, you know, in terms of what we're working on. Um, and I'm happy to keep doing that. So I think um, that is that is the approach we're taking in terms of something um, that's, that's bi-weekly with our design team. I think, you know, with a select group of people, um, we're concerned with the equity impacts of that, quite frankly, um, with, you know, having a, a specific group of people have an outsized you know, influence on a facility and on a schedule and on a budget um, that is a project that's going to affect a lot of folks in a lot of different neighborhoods um, with um, especially, you know, our bus route. And so I think, uh, you know, the approach we've taken is to offer coming to meetings that are typically open to the public. Um, and as I've, I've, I've shown, you know, we've been to 14 of those so far. I'm happy, happy to keep, keep that going and keep bringing updates, listening, and coming back with modifications. Ashley, did you have someone on your side? Oh, no, okay. We'll go back here. Hi, my name is Saranda Ellis. I'm the CEO of the Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Development Corporation. And I really want to 
say that I'm thankful to be in community with my community. Um, I want to just sort of address the 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 obvious. Where's my no? Now there we go. Sorry about that. Um, I just I, I think the the question to the MBTA is where are we about the eight acres? Okay, because I don't think and and I will just say as a member of this community since the early 90s when I joined the organization, we were working through the people's before highways conversation. And now we're talking about the people before assault conversation. And I can assure you all, and many of you were in a lot of those community meetings with us, that we just finished and com completed, almost completed, and it's our partners to severe, just almost complete, um, a beautiful reimagining of Jackson Square because this community and several others rose up against the federal government to say, absolutely not. We are not going to have a highway coming through our neighborhood. And we restitched that neighborhood. So we're certainly not going to allow salt, um, which can find another home. And, and, and no one in here, I don't think, is saying we are not a collaborative community. But that, that effort took 20 years and countless, countless hours, many, many neighbors. We're all here because we want to work on a solution, but we need answers about the critical components. People are definitely going to need to be placed before salt and we can collaborate. And I think you, you heard that very clearly. And so I think the question is, is there an answer today about that? collaboration. So I think what I'd say is thank you for your comment. Um, I think what I'd say is, you know, we have a proposal here that's 6.8 acres open, you know, for being part of that Washington Street, you know, reimagining that's happening. I think you mentioned it with, did you mention it with JPNDC? Um, and, you know, and working on a bunch of projects in, in the area. Um, and so that's something that could really happen if we move forward with this design that we've already been working on for a year. Um, if, you know, there's there's an interest to, to really kind of throw that away and go back, we don't know the timeline. And so I think that we just want to kind of understand with the opportunities that we have, that we've developed with this proposal of 6.8 acres, um, which you know I understand that we're asking for eight, but which is 6.8 acres, really prime, really well shaped and positioned for development and a project that's workable and meets a variety of needs. You know, is that is that acceptable? And so, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I think it's not acceptable. It's and so, our backyard. No, it's not acceptable. We're all here saying we want the eight acres. And we're also saying, let me, is there a representative from the mayor's office here at least? Nobody? You're here. Let me tell you something in this day and age. Salt is not the way to go after ice. It is bad for the environment also. I don't want salt in my neighborhood. Move the salt if you would must use salt somewhere else and let them have that part of that is Boston property, correct? So that we can have our acre back. It's very simple. Please tell Michelle that. I worked for her when she was running for counselor. I believe in her. But we don't need salt in this neighborhood over affordable housing. And we need that acre back, period. Nobody is going to. And my question is, we're having all these community meetings. When you talk about people, this is our neighborhood. And we did everything. And uh, before I moved here about five and a half years ago, there were lots of people working. And yes, people gave you a lot for this and we believe in public transportation we in this day and age either bicycle walk or take public transit as much as possible yes so this is our neighborhood though 
So you have to work with us. You're having community meetings, but is this still going to be shoved down our throats no matter what? Do we really have a say and an objection in our neighborhood to get that acre back? How much power do we have? I don't know. I've seen government say all these community meetings and then they just go ahead and shove it down your throat. Let's see. Well, sure. I'm Chris Osgood. I have the pleasure of working in the mayor's office and also the pleasure of being a JP resident. Uh, and I just want to say, first of all, as was said earlier, thank you to all of you for being here tonight and all the comments that you're expressing tonight. Uh, very clearly about this work, and thank you to the MBTA for your leadership on this project. Obviously, there's a lot of alignment around things like decarbonization, affordable housing, uh, and sort of improvements to public transportation. Obviously, there's some outstanding issues which we're being very clear on tonight. So I'm very appreciative of the comments that are coming. Look forward to working with all of you and the city team about how to move forward on the design process uh, and to think about how that then gets incorporated in the work going forward. Uh, for me, this is really the start of this conversation with all of you, but look forward to continuing that work uh, with each of you going forward. Oh. Sure. Uh, yes. Though I was just sort of asking to sort of reintroduce myself or introduce myself more formally. I sort of a senior advisor to the mayor, uh, focusing on infrastructure related work. Uh, and obviously, there's been a number of conversations about this work over the last 20 plus years, uh, and in particular over the last couple of years on this particular design. Um, I am somewhat new to the last couple of uh, sort of last iterations of this design process. Uh, so I am here really to get your feedback, um, but there is a very clear commitment from the mayor to be engaged in this process and to hear from you tonight. It's not part of this community, it's not listening to us in any way, shape or form. Jared, I, I hear you. Jared, I hear you, but I'm, I'm very much here on her behalf, and I, you're, you're more than welcome to reach out to me as a number of you have in advance of this conversation. Hi, uh, my name is Gabrielle Pay, and I've lived in JP for 35 plus years. Um, I, uh, I think that electric buses are a good idea. I'm not opposed to the facility, but um, I'm very concerned about having our eight acres and having affordable housing. Additionally, green space is very important to me. I moved to this neighborhood to be near the Emerald Necklace, near Franklin Park. So I want to say we need a lot of green space around this facility, and it has a huge roof. In addition to solar panels, why can't we have community gardens on that roof? Can we have community spaces on that roof? For you know, there's no senior center in Jamaica Plain. There's you know, there's a lot of seniors who live in JP. I think we could utilize that roof, not for the eight acres of affordable housing, but for community space. And I and the last thing I want to say is that. Um, there should be care taken not to have um, entryways in the residential parts of the neighborhood. That would be my request. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for your comment. I think we've we've identified opportunities to expand the green space on the Arbor Way side of the site. I'll, I know that was a new comment that I I'd just like to address. Um, and I, I think we can continue working to look at, at that landscaping to be responsive. Um, I know there's a number of other comments. Hello all. Um, my name is Alan Iyer. I've been involved with this for 25 years almost. Um, and we've got immense numbers of hours in this. And uh, I've been asked by the Neighborhood Council has been in development subcommittee on the other way yard to uh, come up with something to say that reflects the sentiments of that uh, housing and development area committee. Um, and so you all have this right here. It's a long form. And I thought maybe we could all just read it together. And it's um, so honor the other way yard MOU, no less than eight acres for impact mitigation. We all want this 
new Arbor Way bus facility in Fleet to happen. I think that's, I think that's true. Um, our issue now is honoring the promise made for no less than eight acres for impact mitigation. In 1998, when the T said they were bringing the seat back to Forest Hills from Roxbury's Bartlett Yard, we said, bring it on. Let's leverage this for fixing generations of blight at the Arbor Way Yard. And we didn't call it back, uh, transit-oriented development back then. We've now spent 25 years working hard to make this happen. For the last 20 years, we've lived with the blight of the fleet temporary facility. We're an NIMBY, not NIMBY here in Forest Hills. We're doing the hard work that makes good cities work. We live with major multimodal transit hubs serving a huge amount of Boston. We went along with removing the overpass to make the Arbor Way Parkway, knowing it'd bring traffic jams to our residential street. We're taking in thousands of workforce housing units with more to come. We're working for affordable housing with family-sized units. We're taking in hundreds of low threshold supportive housing units and, and uh, SUD beds, which is uh, substance use disorder beds. And we welcome this massive bus garage and HG2 with three quarters of a million vehicle trips, 200 heavy lumbering battery transit buses and trucks and cars coming and going all day long, 365 days a year. We've put in countless hours of study, meetings, and lobbying. In 2021, our knowledge and experience saved the MBTA and the BPDA from a colossal and costly blunder. That's in your, in your pieces you have there. Um, late last fall, things were looking pretty good. And then after 25 years, the rug gets pulled out from, up, from up underneath us. Years ago, we found a new home for the DPW site when the city couldn't manage it. We did that. And now the DPW site comes back to violate the MOU. We don't care if salt, toxics, and mulch are here. We just want the MOU's promised eight acres for impact mitigation. We live in an urban desert of services. We live in a food desert, a pharmacy desert, a farm desert. We support, we love and support the businesses here, but look at Washington Street. Take a walk here in the day, better yet after dark. We spent 25 years trying to leverage this industrial facility across from a major transit hub for blight repair, affordable housing, needed retail, green space, a livable streetscape, and some fun space. This is transit-oriented development in action. Why do we need all the promised eight acres? Are we greedy? We have a major transit hub serving a diverse community like us. Many of these transit users live in their own food and retail deserts. Imagine folks could get off the subway, cross the street, and shop before getting on the bus to go home. We need the full acres with its depth to have the space to make this feasible. On the front, we need space for complete streets, real bike lanes, maybe a turn lane for buses, and nice wide sidewalks, and some greenery and open area. In the back, we need space to serve dense housing and retail, service, delivery, garbage lanes, and a fire lane that'll also serve the bus facility, and maybe a little sidewalk for safe passage back there. And we need distance to separate the new housing from the looming seven-story tall bus facility. In my personal hope, this backside might give rise to needed blue collar and maker space. We just need the acres, the site depth, and later we all work out our hopes and dreams. What we are doing here will endure generations into the next century. This is a responsibility. We promise to continue our work to make this massive facility a benefit not a liability. Please honor the Arborway MOU and get us our promise eight acres for impact mitigation. Thank you. Thank you from a couple other folks, and then we'll pause for feedback. Hello, my name is Louise Johnson. I live in Jamaica Plain, um, and I support Alan's, um, what he read is really well-written and, and very thoughtful. Um, but I had a 
a little different question. I was just, um, if you could talk a little bit more about um, Eversource um, and the electric um, power that's coming in. Um, it seems like a huge amount. Um, and I can't imagine there's not going to be some sort of a substation that needs to be built. Um, and where is that going to be built? And what kind of impact does that have on a community? Uh, noise levels, um, whatever yeah. electrical waves that are going on. Um, it seemed like um, there wasn't a lot said and I was a little concerned about that. No, that's a great question. Um, thank you. Yeah, we're going to go to the site plan, actually. Yeah, so um, we're, what we're planning is that Eversource would come in from Washington Street. Um, you know, it is a really big load, but I think as we seek to electrify everything in the next 30 years, we're going to see a lot of these types of loads, really big loads. Um, that the electrical, you know, utility companies are going to need to meet. Um, they would come in and have their um, substation equipment on that little green parcel you see, kind of right by Stony Road, um, and then connect. And all of our intern, all of our switchgear for, you know, MBTA operations would be indoors. Um, so definitely um, soundproof. They would have their transformers, um, similar to what you see for, you know, most new developments where the, you see it's called like PMAE or PMH sometimes, um, those boxes would be outside. Um, uh, we've targeted that location. Yeah, I think, I think it's a great question. Um, and it's something that we'll be dealing more and more with as everyone electrifies everything. Um, in terms of, you know, what we've been hearing on the eight acres, like I'd Love to hear some more thoughts. I know everyone wants to speak. I think, you know, as I mentioned, and I did want to highlight this, you know, we are working closely with the city um, on this project in general, but specifically also on that 25 space visitor parking lot. Um, and so, you know, that's something that hopefully we'll be able to identify a solution for. Um, and we'll definitely come back um, to the community with what we are able to, uh, you know, find up in the, the northern corner of the site, um, which could definitely uh, provide a little bit more, more space, whether that's formerly part of the acreage that's developed or kind of more of like a green space that has some stormwater infrastructure underneath is something we'd have to look at. Um, but I do want to highlight that. I mentioned that at the end of the presentation and, and make note of that again in response to some of these comments. So, we want to thank you. Hello. Oh, this is louder than anticipated. Good evening, everybody. Um, for those who do not know me, my name is Kendra Lara, and I am your city councilor. Very excited to be here with you all. Thank you so much to the team at the MBTA for all your hard work, but thank you for fighting for this community as you typically do. Uh, I wanted to stand up and make sure that I said something because this is an issue that has been front of mind in my office. You have been to all of my coffee hours, <laughs> you have called, you have emailed me, and having a conversation about what happens in the Arboway now that I, I just recently moved um, over in St. Rose, so now I am in the neighborhood as well, <laughs> um, is incredibly important to me. I serve as the chair of the Housing Committee on the City Council, and I serve as the chair of the Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks Committee on the City Council, so I hope that you do not have to question what my commitment is. It's to our environment, to making sure that we're a resilient city and to making sure that we are building as much housing as possible in all of the places that we can. I also want to say that I am hearing the feedback and the concern about whether or not the mayor or the mayor's office is really present uh, in this process. But I do want to say that I have been in conversation with Chris and some of the folks in the mayor's team. The BPDA gave me a call last week to talk about this MOU. And so I am committed to making the case for more presence, more involvement on this issue from the mayor's office, but they have been in conversation with me and my office to be responsive to this. Uh, we have a long history of being called idealistic in JPU. They told us that we were being idealistic when we were fighting against the highway, when we tried to stop the Kmart, they told us that we couldn't do that either. When we fought to redevelop Mildred Haley, that was also a fight and so, this is our history. This is really what anchors our neighborhood, is that we are a group of people who are willing to fight for what we know is right. And fighting for these eight acres is the right thing to do. Thanks,
And my hope is that as your representative, I can stand beside you in that fight. And I can also work closely and collaboratively with the mayor's office to make sure and find a way for us to do that. Uh, my hope is that we'll be having some conversations about this on the city council. So we can come in here from the Department of Public Works and the administration about what we can do about the 1.3 acres and to work collaboratively with the MBTA to see how we can extract as much of that space as possible. The people in our community deserve to have vibrant space. They deserve to have affordable housing, truly affordable housing, not at 80% AMI. <laughs> uh, and so I just wanted to let you know that you have a partner in this fight in me and we will continue to be in conversation. I am grateful for all of the work that you're doing. I know that this is only a 15% project and I hope that the feedback that you're hearing today from the community will um, have an impact on what this looks like the next time that we're together. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael F. I've been a resident of Jamaica Plain for uh, 43 years. Uh, I'm also a transportation architect. Uh, much of my career in Boston, I've been work had the pleasure of working with the MBTA. Uh, I did uh, the South Station uh, bus terminal. I know a little bit about buses. I did Charles uh, Red Line Station, the new head house there, and also did the uh, Green Line concept for stations. Uh, in all of those projects, we always went out to the local community because the local community is the area that is impacted by a physical structure. It's not the regional you know, community. The regional community is affected by uh, transit policy. And I think you know, electric buses are fabulous. I think increasing the amount of bus service in, in all communities in, in Boston is needed and we should demand that from the MBTA. Um, on the uh, Charles Street project, we went into the first meeting with the community with no drawings, no drawings. We wanted to find out what their goals were, and we let them know what we thought our goals were, and it had that kind of process back and forth. We developed a number of options, and we showed them the pluses and minuses. On the green line, we had a meeting every two weeks with different parts of the community anyone from any one of the three cities to show up to any of those meetings, every single public comment was written down and we asked for the telephone number or the email address of that person and we got back to them and published every single comment. When I went in uh, the first time that we talked to folks uh, uh, at uh, Tufts uh, University, I said, look, uh, this, as an architect, I should treat this as if it was going on in my neighborhood. And I gave them my phone number. If, and I said, if you want to have something to, you, that you tell me that I should really know about, just call me. Just make sure it's, you know, before 1130 at night. So, you know, the MOU, people have talked about paragraph seven of the MOU says it's a legal and binding document. Uh, it also says that you know, the uh, communication process should be extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, you know, you're, you're putting a project on the Emerald Necklace. Uh, it's been mentioned before. You have buses running in front of the, uh, along the Emerald Necklace. The connection to Franklin Park is basically DC, uh, our property. You're not increasing that connection one bit. Uh, that's part of the MOU that says that you should have a minimum of an 85 foot uh, pathway there with no part of it less than 65 feet. Uh, I think it'd be a good idea to go back and reread the MOU and know that there are people in this community that want to support you, have had a many, many year history of supporting you, and we're here to get this thing done, but let's get it done right. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Michael, for your comment. Um, you know, and I, I think, as I have mentioned, and so I won't won't be too too repetitive, but um, we've really made an effort to come and speak with as many groups as possible, as often as folks have have asked and be responsive. I have my email and phone number all over the place, um, and so please continue to reach out. Um, I think you you brought up. Carlos MGH as a, as a good example of, you know, going out and seeing what folks are wanting for a public facing station. I think that's exactly how we've approached 
the core requirements of this facility with our internal operational staff. Um, because you know they it, it needs to work for them first and foremost, and that really drives the program, the architectural program um, of what we're working with. And then you know we've come come to you with everything that we are able to to adjust. And I you know demonstrated in this presentation how we've made adjustments based on the specific feedback. I think it was you who mentioned you know to industrial. Um, we'll keep working. We'll keep doing that. So I think um, look look forward to continuing the conversation coming out to the JPNC meetings um, as you guys invite me. My name is Nancy Allen. I'm very well. um, I live on Washington Street, and my bedroom quite literally overlooks the LNG facility. Um, you keep mentioning the community meetings that you had, and I actually attended two of the community meetings in fall of 2022, and. I said, yes, I was really happy. I was pretty happy with the 2022 plan. Um, and I think most of us in this room are pretty happy with the 2022 plan. All we're asking is for you to go back to that plan. And the reason that we keep bringing up the mayor and the reason that we keep bringing up where is she and what's going on is because DPW is a city entity and DPW was not in the plan in fall 2022 that we were all pretty happy with. So there has clearly been a communication breakdown. And it, in my view, is clearly the city. Um, the city is forcing the MBTA to put DPW back in there that wasn't there before. So this community has consistently said yes to the Arbor Way Yard, um, to immense changes, to more housing. We keep saying yes, and we just, all we want to do is say yes to to the fall 2022 plan. That's it. Hi, my name is Martha Karsher and I've lived in Jamaica Plain for about 35 years. And I also support um, keeping the eight acres for affordable housing in the Arbor Way plan. But I have a question um, in addition, which is, um, has uh, the MBTA considered housing over the electrification bus facility. Um, there are other, um, I think other cities that have done this or are in the process of doing it like San Francisco. And um, have you considered it? And if not, uh, why not? Thanks for that question. Um, we have taken you know, a look at that opportunity, but found that um, it's not something that is, you know, feasible on the timeline we're working with. And it does, if we were to go with that approach, it wouldn't allow us to maximize the much more easily developable, developable um, parcels that are on, you know, terra firma on Washington Street, um, because you'd have to account for kind of additional egress and entrance points and lobbies for folks. We'd have to work through how that works in terms of joint development, which could be a very lengthy and complicated real estate process. Um, and then we'd also have to kind of think about if it even pencils out for a developer, because we've got some really large structural spans that I need to accommodate our buses. And I'm not sure how it, it's pencing out in, in San Francisco, um, but I think it's something that would be, you know, very uh, challenging to make work um, financially uh, from a development perspective. And so our approach has been, okay, let's squeeze down as much as we can so that we can maximize the acreage that's just, you know, on the ground um, for housing development. But they, thanks for the question. Hi, uh, I'm Pam Bender. Uh, I've been involved in the other one yard way too long. Um, if I had children, I think they would probably be working on this too. Um, I want to correct a couple of things you said earlier that I just don't think are true. You said you've been working on this plan for over a year. Well, I wanted to emphasize what Nancy said. In the winter of 2021, we saw a very different plan. Um, and you also said this plan doesn't differ markedly from what we've been working on for the last 20 years which is also not true. The designs for the, the yard that the design review committee worked on for 
15, 20 years did not in any way, shape or form encroach upon those eight acres. Um, we've also been told by the T, oh, well, even if the city gave us back the DPW lot, we couldn't change, it takes too long. Well, that's winter, you change the plans pretty quickly when the DPW lot got taken off the table. Um, I have to say all of these statements make me very, very distrustful of what the T is telling us. I don't feel like we can believe what you say or trust to have a real honest dialogue with you. And that's very disappointing because for 20 years we did. I worked with um, at least three different general managers of the T when I was a member of the Community Planning Committee for the Avalon right. Yard. And um, this, this, this community has worked, as Alan said, we've worked way too long and way too hard to be treated with such disrespect now. So thanks, Pam, for your comment. I, I'm, I'm very sorry that you feel that way. Um, in terms of the working on it for a year, that was in regards to kind of an alternatives analysis process that we started and that I described to JPMC. I think over the winter, we started last summer as we were working with the city and kind of looking at what are the alternatives um, that we can approach for this this site given their needs and given a range of other issues. Um, and so, you know, that's that was that reference to the year. Um, and I think the reference to the previous plans, like the plans from 2006, 2009 timeframe was um, not in reference to all the entirety of the design, but just the acreage that was identified for community development and affordable housing is um, similar to what we've identified here um, in that previous plan. There was also like other, uh, a, a diff it was before the Casey Overpass project, the MLS connector. So it was a different treatment of how to connect to Franklin Park, which added up to eight acres. But um, I think if we if we take a look at some of those plans that I think many of you were involved in, um, we're, we're working with something similar, but um, Happy to clarify uh, the way in which I've communicated this to just um, underscore the honesty here. Um, hi, uh, my name is Fred Betterline, and uh, I was actually in CCPA Y meetings here uh, many years ago with Bernie and Alan Mitchell, who were all very important in what went on. And uh, I want to say that, first of all, I want to thank uh, Kendra Laura for showing up. I want to, I think uh, Sam uh, might have helped get this meeting together with you because this is the first public meeting since COVID. And I think it's really important for this community. I mean, I haven't seen so many. I think it's a great turnout. And I think a lot of it is because it is a meeting and we're together. I want to give a little bit of credit uh, to you. I, I feel as though, um, the buses can supplement all the problems we're having with the trains. I know there's politics involved, and that screws things up as well for the MBTA. But I've seen you make, I'm just going to give you a little bit of credit. I've seen you make some changes to the design. I, I like that you thought about the Arbor Way, uh, the connection, the emerald necklace. You brought the building back from eight stories to maybe a three story height, a three family height along the Arbor Way. But what it, um, that's just a, a little bit of credit. And I, I like the design. I like how you've improved it. And I, I'd like to congratulate you for your design in Forest Hills, what you did with the bus. I think you can do good architecture and good design. But it all comes back to the city. Now, we haven't had a meeting to face the city. And I'm only going to take a little bit away from you. And you don't have to answer this. But I really feel that, I mean, we've seen that the, the salt yard was going to, be there for the last six months. But I think we were all so appalled that we sat back and then slowly we got, we were like, oh, we're going to have a public meeting and let's finally talk about it. And I think it's terrible design. It's a salt yard without a cover. It's just terrible in every way. DPW has another site on Canterbury Street about two blocks away. That's not even considered. I mean, uh, Alan and uh, Mitch watched the pole yard uh, be cleared of poles, and now it's a salt yard. So I want to say that 
only because I have a public forum here. And to tell you the truth, I'm not so much criticizing you because you're working with what you have, but again, you are working with what is a bad plan. And um, I just, I guess, while I'm at it, I'd also like to say, what about Franklin Park? What about the master plan? Three years, they've spent a million dollars and we got nothing, nothing. Uh, what about the shout? Now, what is it, 800 units of housing, a, a, a low threshold? I'm only saying that because of the public forum here, you don't have to answer that. But um, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, Hello. Wow, that is like. Um, first question, I'm more, more logistic. I'm less passionate than both sides, probably. But if you were to build this as it's designed, are you doing full solar panels across the roofs of both structures? And what uh, what mitigation of electric, electrical needs is that? Would you still need a substation? Um. Typically, when we've done solar, we've done it through like a, a power purchase agreement um, where because we get a really good you know, rate on our electricity, it's really just like offsetting and going back into the grid. Um, we sell it back to the grid, um, but it is an important tool for resiliency as well. Um, it is a lot of solar opportunity, but it's not as much as you need. It's not as if it would, you know, kind of reduce significantly what we expect we need and at our peak demand. So what percent um, of your electrical needs would be met by the solar panels? And are you doing sunny. are you doing the full like roofs of both? Yeah, we'll, we'll look to maximize. I mean, we do have some mechanical equipment planned for the roof to help us minimize our footprint, um, but we'll definitely look to maximize it. That it's really beneficial to us. We don't know the percentage yet. Um, any, so, any solar company will tell you the percent of your, like, I just put solar panels on my roof and they tell right. you exactly how much you offset. Have you done that yet? We've done an initial study of the capacity. Have you had a solar company come by and tell you exactly how much of your electrical needs and whether that's offset to you enough to not need a substation? I don't think it would offset us needing a substation um, based on the initial calculation. We will go through our routine open procurement process um, when we purchase uh, or when we come to an agreement with a solar company for installation and you know operation and maintenance of the solar. Um, so more to come on that. We're definitely planning for it. Um, and, and working about how we can make use of it to offset our load. Um, thanks, thanks for your question. Okay, well, I have another one. Um, Chris, I think Michelle used to be the local rep here. I've only lived in the neighborhood 10 years, but I definitely voted for her as local rep. Why is she not here? I, I, I get that, but like, it's a very passionate local neighborhood that used to vote for her as city council. She should be here. That's okay. Um, I guess my final comments might go against most of this crowd, but it is the ugliest parking lot I've ever seen. It is the ugliest MBTA building on at 500 hour way I've ever seen. It looks like where serial killers would go. I understand the objection to to everyone wanting like their perfect design. But is there compromise? Get rid of the salt pile, which I don't even know about, but apparently seems to upset a lot of people. Make the building slightly smaller. Like, have we gone back and forth and thought about you get a little bit of what you want, you get a little bit of what you want, because it just seems to be two diametrically opposed sides who refuse to compromise. Get rid of the salt pile and make the building smaller, and everyone votes yes. Like, it just seems like there's no compromise going on in this room. So that's my final thought. Oh, over, uh... final, final thought. A lot of this crowd is holding on to some 25 year old understanding. I grew up in Marblehead, Massachusetts, where I grew up across the street from a building, a house with a corner missing, 
And it says in 1780, they had to cut the corner out of the building so George Washington's carriage should fit down the road. Times do and will always change. And I understand people holding on to an old agreement, but also future. So compromise is my only thought. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Kevin Bott. I've lived in Jamaica Plain uh, a little bit well, on the other side of Franklin Park for the last 30 years. I have a basic question for you. You're taking a lot of heat when the DPW should be taking the seat, and why is there not? I, I can understand the mayor have many, many, many responsibilities across the, the city. Why is the DPW not here tonight? Representative of the DPW, they should answer the question why they are taking that at the last minute after a 25 year process. Where are they and what is their reason for holding on to the salt, the polling yard? Where are they? I mean, I can't provide an answer to that question, but. but. But I do know that, you know, we we need the salt on the roads too. We need the DPW too for our buses to run, um, you know, in all weather to make sure we're getting folks where they need to go. So that is our approach to, you know, our partnership with the city is understanding like we both provide these functions that are important but are difficult to to find space for because they are not as exciting as some of the other things that we see in cities. Um, and so, you know, that's that's just all I'll say. But yeah, I need the DPW to answer the question. That's simple. I don't know. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sam Montano. I'm the state representative for this district. Um, first, I, just, I, I, I did want to extend a thank you to the MBTA because from here, after hearing from some folks about having an in-person meeting, they uh, accommodated this ask. So thank you for showing up in person. Um, second, we have heard myself with the counselor and Senator Miranda's office is over there with Kevin, have heard the concerns um, around getting the city more involved. And we have been talking with the city about uh, any flexibility at all with the missing 1.3 acres. So this is something that we are moving, but again, organizing on the outside always does help. Um, so continue to do the work that you're doing and we'll continue to work in collaboration with you. But thank you for being here. And thank you for showing up in person. Hey there, I'm, uh, I'm Benji Mauer. I, I live over on Brookside Ave. Um, I guess I have a direct question and then a comment. Um, my direct question is, have you or other members of your team been in conversations with the city or DPW about the legal ramifications or risks of violating the MOU? Um, I think, I mean, we've, we've talked about it been in, in conversation about this project and from my understanding we're in agreement with our approach to this project um, and how it accommodates all of our all of our needs um, and and that it that the MOU doesn't represent a substantial legal risk to the completion of the project it sounds like not not in discussions so far okay and so the this plan is the result of those conversations about the risks of the MOU in the sense in the sense that it's looking to maximize all of the uh needs and priorities that have been identified by the community and all those stakeholders um maximize them to the extent possible uh yes okay that's that is how we approach the design that's that's very interesting um so i guess you know my comment is really that you know there was a moment um, at the beginning of the Q&A where you're sort of talking about this project and it was, you know, is it happening over a year? And if we want to throw it out, then like we don't know about the timeline of the project. And I just want to say that sort of holding the, the timeline of this project and and the substantial benefits to this neighborhood that it, that it would bring, especially if it had eight acres, hostage because folks are advocating for a process that they've been involved in for 20 years. Um, because you have to scrap your plan of one year. It's just, it's super disrespectful. It, it, it sucks for the people that have been involved and spent hundreds if not thousands of hours of their lives trying to benefit the neighborhood that they live in. 
I don't really care if you have spent a year on this project. Um, and I don't think that it's fair to hold that hostage for the benefits to the neighborhood. Like it's just, yeah, it just, it just really, it really bothers me and rubs me the wrong way. And it kind of makes all of this feel so much worse to put that one year above the effort of this community over so many years. Um, I mean, I know many of these people that have been on these committees that have been in the neighborhood meetings for the 20 years that I've lived here. And I know they're extremely dedicated and I just want to impress that upon you. And I think it's just, and the fact that, that you all are accepting the DP, DPW salt pile in over affordable, additional affordable housing, you know, it's, it's rubbing salt in the wounds. So. No, I, I appreciate your, your concern and the, the validation of folks who have been working on this for a long time. I think um, it's, it's less so like the year we've spent or a couple of years we've spent on these concepts and more thinking about how can we get to an actual built facility, which then is when we'll actually get to the housing that we want because we need to open the facility first. And so, you know, kind of taking it back to the drawing board really does risk a elongated and uncertain timeline um, when I think this is something that we could really have sooner. We can have people living there sooner um, if we're able to kind of move forward with the concept that we have now. So I think that's, you know, and I, I live in the neighborhood too. Like, I... I walked here from Fire Hill Street, I took the 2 up to Chicago Hills, and I walked here from Fire Hill Station, and I want to see Washington Street developed as well. So I yeah, and I just I would just add to that I don't I certainly I certainly didn't interpret what Alexander said as as trying to be a threatening or standoffish. I think the reality is I, I think we're all working towards trying to to balance a lot of competing goals. We do have a legal commitment that the legislature has put on us to, to buy on electric buses within six years from now. We do have a fleet that will need to be retired by the end of this decade. We, we will need to, it's just a reality. We will need to do something with this facility before then if we're going to be able to shift to electric away from fossil fuel burning. So, so I think Alexander's just pointing those things out. And Bernie made a good point earlier too about cost escalation and how difficult it is to get these budgets right and get these things funded. So we're not necessarily in a in an environment where it's a slam dunk, we'll be able to fund it as it is right now, right? But but I think we're better positioned with the momentum we have for this program, you know, now than if we wait. I think that's all. Alexander's just trying to make sure every you know we, we're all trying to get to the to the right place. So we 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 should all be aware that there are these other competing timelines that um, we don't. Yeah, you know, Alexander's not in control of. The T's not in control of. I think that's all she was trying to say. I didn't. I don't think she was trying to challenge or, or you know. She better. Hello, my name is Joanne Zidick and I live in the neighborhood. And um, although I care about all of these issues that were mentioned tonight, um, I just want to highlight open space. Um, that's something I'm particularly concerned about. And um, I think having the eight acres as was um, agreed to would be very important because my understanding is that there would be retail, excuse me, retail and housing and open space as part of those eight acres. I'm also in favor of those other things. Um, I, also, I also think, um, oh, how to put it, I, I almost weep at that narrow little connector the Emerald Necklace Connector, and I know that's a battle that was fought, fought a long time ago with other agencies. So my plea would be anything you can do to not uh, detract from that. And by that, I mean, if you are going to do landscaping in that tiny little space that you showed in your diagram with some trees and flowers, be sure to put landscape maintenance money in the budget so it does not become an area of dead trees and weeds. Also, um, 
the discussion that has taken place about the building being industrial looking, I can see, I'm not an architect, but I can see how the gray brick may be an improvement. But I have to say those large green panels look like a third grader was given the assignment to uh, change the look and make it less industrial and, and a 30 minute limit. And that's what they came up with. I mean, I cannot imagine how those are going to make it look less industrial. And to me, they would be a complete affront to that little tiny sad strip of emerald necklace connector. So anything you can do to make that building honor that piece of the emerald nectar, emerald nectar, emerald necklace connector, um, I think would be greatly appreciated by the community. There has to be a better solution than that. Thank you. I just, um, so it's, it's eight o'clock. The meeting was sort of uh, announced as a meeting ending at eight. We did start a little bit late with the with the big tech issues everybody sort of experienced there at the beginning of the meeting. So I think we're we're happy to take questions for another 15 minutes. I'm going to put Alexandra's contact information back up on the screen so everybody has, she's happy to take your calls, uh, emails, and, and we'll get back to you. But uh, I, just those who still have questions, please try to keep them, the comments or questions, you know, to, to maybe a minute just so we can get as many people in at the end here as possible. I know you have your hand up. Oh, I was, uh, Alan, do you mind if we go? She hasn't gone yet. Maybe just go to folks who haven't spoken yet, if, if possible. Uh, Louisa Fumo, I live in uh, Eggleston Square. I'm just wondering if the salt pile, this is just because I'm confused. Is it being relocated from Jackson Square? But the one, that's going to stay there? That's been there for like 40 years, that salt pile uncovered next to a playground. That's a hazard. So uh, it's too bad nobody can. No, thank you. So, thank you for that comment. Yeah, it's it's there now. Um, the the functions, the DPW functions, are there today. Um, and the Marcello one is still there. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Aditi Shivastav, and I recently shifted to Party Six. I don't know if I've missed out on anything, but uh, most of this construction can be taken down to the uh, basement level. And the DPW side, which holds most of the salt pile, can also be uh, shifted down there. So I don't see why the why an issue should be over here. That's it. So, so the comment is just um, going underground with the facility? Yeah, if you go underground, a lot of the uh, area can be used for open spaces. Yeah. And you don't need a second floor. It could be basically contained on the ground floor. The no, DPW I... site could easily be shifted to the basement floor, and a lot of the problem could be solved easily. Yeah, and I think a challenge with going underground is um, it's, it's really cost um, of excavation, of having a basement, and, and particularly of proper um, soil disposal that adheres to all the um, requirements that we have in Massachusetts. Um, and can be um, can be quite expensive given the history of this site, um, and that we anticipate, you know, that there are materials in that soil that require a specific way um, to dispose of it. Um, so it's it's something that we have seen as cost prohibitive, um, and that's actually you know part of the reason why that that previous plan we re we wanted to rethink it anyway was. Um, to avoid the basement that we had planned um, for some employee parking uh, to reduce costs, make the project more deliverable. Uh, but thanks, but thank you for the comment. Something we've, we've thought about as well, but not, not the best fit for this site right now. I'm in David Vitali Wolf. I'm part of the Stony Brook Neighborhood Association. Um, so I was talking to my eight year old son about this. We were walking by the states and he was very excited to have potential retail and stores and things like that. And we talked about also the salt storage and he, his suggestion was to put it somewhere else to find a different place for it. So I wanted to just speak on his behalf and also just say how exciting it, the possibility is here to have more housing just a walking distance, like one block away from transit and 
I just want to really emphasize how precious that it is to have open land, more housing right next to the train. Um, housing, so so I think it's a golden opportunity that we really should should seize and find another place for that salt. Thank you. Hey, a couple more expert comments, uh, Sarah. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Sarah Freeman. Um, I live up the Arbor Way a couple blocks um, from the bus yard, but have been involved for decades in discussions. Um, I want to second, I'm wearing the sticker, but for those who can't see, priority one is certainly to honor the past agreements. This is a question of public trust. And I won't repeat everything everyone has said, but the, the fact that the temporary facility has outlived its promise by so long and the number of buses is being so increased and it just seems like we're bending over backwards to accommodate all of that and it, would be nice to hear the powers that be, city and state, say yes in a way that it wouldn't cause delay. It's like when you found out about Lotus Street, you made the design change quickly. When you found out about the DPW site, you made the design change quickly. Um, I think, I hope, I don't know if Ruth's still here, I really hope you take the local architects up on their offer to maybe say, hey, we have some ideas how you could get a win-win here. And I really don't like to feel like it's us against them or this advocate against that advocate. I always go into these things saying, isn't there a way we can try to accommodate all wishes? And I'll be brief with a couple of questions I might have missed this in the presentation, but what is the current height? I know you said it's a couple feet reduced. About about six feet, six feet. Six zero? Yeah. Okay. And I hate to bring this up, but I'm so um, moved by Joanne's comment. I think there's a flaw in your drawings, in the images, whatever they're called, that the DCR Greenway bike and green space looks like part of your project, but it isn't. I mean, it's there, but you haven't given anything to add to the green space. And there is, is Chris still here? Awesome. Hi. Um, there is a parkway ordinance. There are setback requirements. And I'm sorry, I didn't think of this a year or more ago whenever I first saw how close the new building is. If you look at the existing conditions, there's a pretty good breathing space along the Arbor Way now, along that DCR um, new, relatively new bike path. A building coming right up to the edge of your property or a handful of feet away will be a humongous change. And so I just ask for creativity and also find out that ordinance. I printed it out today. It's 7-4.12 um, setback requirements of the parks and rec. Oh, here, I can give it to you. But you can, I, yeah, I made two copies, you can have one. Uh, so real fast, I think that's about done. Uh, oh, the comments about a small group having outsized influence. I just want to underscore what Michael F. I think said that we're the ones that live near this. The buses serve the whole region, and thank goodness they'll be cleaner, and hopefully they'll be housing on the eight acres. But the neighbors of your building, that's going to be here for many, many decades. If it's built well, maybe a hundred years. So let's think of it again in a spirit of how can we make it work? And 
not come back the next time without some better response. It was in good spirit. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, Alan, why don't you take us home with a final comment and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is really great. And um, um, just I want to reiterate what Sarah said. The T can do this. They can make these changes. They've done it before. They've gone through this over the, over this uh, since I first started looking at these drawings. They've done their value engineering. They've streamlined the facility. They've they've removed a lot of space. They've they they know the engineers. They know the site, they know the facility, they know just what they need to do to make it work. They moved it once very recently. They can do that again. And so that the DPW site, it's got, it's, it's got salt on it as a kind of the, this is what we're talking about. But there's right now it's got mulch on it. And there's some discussion that it's going to become a toxic reclamation site or, or where people bring their toxics. And the, the DPW wants that to be close to a, a T-stop. And, you know, I don't know how many people are going to be bringing a leaky can of paint on the on the subway with them to, uh, to the DPW yard. If they're going to do that, they can probably get on a bus and go to the next, uh, go to the site. Um, so, the team, the, the city can can say we're going to find a spot for those three uses, whether it's salt, mulch, or toxic reclamation. Um, it's the city that needs to tell the team, yes, we need to do this. We need to move this off the site. We're sorry. Let's all work together and move the facility back, as Nancy said, to the 2022 location and. And let's get moving ahead. Let's work together on this. That's that's where we thought we were at last year. It was like, okay, we're going to start sort of figuring out the edges and how to make this work. And now, you know, we're in this this crazy situation that none of us want to be here. None of us want to be working on this this way and having this argument. And most of everybody in the audience here agree on what we would like to see. And and it's and we want to see something. It's going to serve the whole city. It's going to serve a massive amount of the city, and we're taking major hits from it. Lots of impacts, and we just want our due, our just due. We want this this the MOU. We may not be signatories to it, but I see it. It's like a promissory note to the community from 20 plus years ago that if you do this, we will do this, and. The city and the, I guess, primarily the city is not living up to that promissory note to the community. And, um, you know, I think it's it's really unfortunate and, you know, shouldn't be this way. We shouldn't be needing to do this, but here we are and hope the city will listen. Thank you. Hey, well, uh, I'm I'm glad we're able to be here in person um, and have this conversation. And I really want to thank everyone for for coming out. Um, it's it's been a great opportunity to talk about this project, and I think you know we understand um, the comments, uh, and we will continue to come out um, in those other forums that we've discussed. Um, and lo I look forward to hearing from you. Please feel free to reach out to me personally with any questions or additional comments about this project. Um, thank you again, and I look forward to hearing from you.